Hi, hello, and welcome, nerds. This is Let's Talk About Myths, baby. And I am your host, she who loves conversation episodes so very much, Liv. Today, I am speaking with Professor Karen Carr, who has just published a book about ancient swimming practices. How wild is that? A whole book about the history of swimming, spanning, as far as I can tell, the whole of the world. Well, I guess it's world swimming, but this episode spans the whole of the world, too. Professor Carr joined me in this episode to talk about ancient swimming, but specifically as it connects with the story of Hero and Leander and beyond. But that is why it's coming into your ears after I covered the story on the podcast. Because it's not only Hero and Leander, though. A whole collection of stories from the ancient world, from the Mediterranean to Africa to India to the Maori people. It turns out everyone has some kind of take on this story or this style of story. And it is so fascinating. I'm always so thrilled when academics want to come on and talk about their topics like, generally. I love it. But there is an extra thrill when I hear from people who present something that I would have never, ever even remotely thought about or thought to look into. Like ancient swimming, which in hindsight seems so important and such like a vital thing in that world. But oh my god, just so interesting. This was such a fun conversation, so insightful and unique. Learning new things is cool, don't you think? Conversations. Just keep swimming. Hero, Leander, and the world of ancient swimming with Professor Karen Carr. The story of Hero and Leander, uh, people have asked me to cover it on the podcast. I have not yet dived into it. It's actually one of the few that I really wasn't very familiar at all. Like I like to think that almost any Greek myth you can throw at me and I'll at least know the basics. But when it came to this one, I just knew the names. Um, and so I was really interested to see yours. And I think what I'll do is try to cover it on the podcast before this airs so that my listeners have that kind of grounding as well. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, why don't you tell me a little bit about that myth, but specifically how it relates to you've written a book about swimming in the ancient world. And it seems oh, it's so interconnected with this story in so many mythologies. So I'm just, I'm so interested in basically all of that. <laughs> well, the, the, it's not actually surprising that you don't know the story of Hero and Leander, because it's not a story that is told over and over again in Greek mythology. And, you know, it doesn't really appear in Homer or in, you know, there's no uh, play of Euripides that tells the story. Or, you know, it's kind of a minor story, really, that becomes more famous later mm -hmm. um, in the Middle Ages, in Shakespeare. Then it becomes kind of common knowledge. But as far as the ancient world is concerned, it's, relative, it's a relatively minor story. So we know the story from Ovid. Well, I mean, we know the story from a telling of it that is said to be by Ovid, but we aren't even mm. sure that it is by Ovid or when it was written. Um, and we know that, that people were telling this story, at least by the time Pompeii was destroyed in 79 AD, because there are paintings of what's clearly Leander swimming to Hero hmm. with the, you know, he's swimming and there's the tower and the girl in the tower. I mean, it's clearly the right story. Uh, there are paintings of it from the walls of houses at Pompeii. Um, and there are actually, I think, three different houses at Pompeii that have this story. So it's clearly something that's kind of in people's minds in the, in the first century AD. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe because Ovid had written about it. 
so it, but it's not surprising it, it wasn't i think you know the world's best known story in antiquity mm-hmm. i feel like the names are so recognizable and that's what makes you think that it is and then yeah that i mean that makes perfect sense especially if it's just ovid so i mean that's what happens is it be, it becomes better known because um shakespeare refers to it in the tempest and, and, you know, it's just, it becomes a better known story uh, in modern times. Mm. Um, but the, uh, the ancient story, this is the basic story of Hero and Leander, right? Leander falls in love with this girl Hero who lives on the other side of the Hellespont from him. So it's like a, a, it's a several miles across the hell. It's a couple of miles across the hell. It's a pretty good mm-hmm. swim. Uh, it's not impossible, but it's really farther than ordinary people would want to swim. Yeah. Uh, and uh, she's a priestess of Aphrodite, so she can't marry. Uh, so he swims over there every night to meet with her secretly. And uh, then... Um, And she puts an oil lamp in her window to guide him as he's swimming. Uh, But one night there's a bad storm, but he decides to swim over anyway because he loves her so much. Uh, And the wind blows out her lamp and he can't find the tower and he drowns. Uh, And Hero leaps from her tower into the water to try to save him and drowns also. So it's a tragic story. She she drowns, he drowns. Uh, it's a warning about the dangers of swimming, clearly. Um, mm-hmm. But it's also a, a story about the dangers of romantic love, right? And how if you insist on romantic love, even against society, uh, you can end up drowned. Right? Mm-hmm. So It feels very Shakespearean. <laughs> right, sure. In the Greek version, it's a tragedy. Uh, it's very sad. And what's interesting to me about this is that we might just say, well, that's how it is. I mean, swimming is dangerous, and that's how anybody would tell this story. Um, and what's important for me is that you that if you look at European swimming culture, European ways of telling this story, in comparison to other people's ways of telling this story elsewhere in the world, you see that, you know, there are a lot of different ways to tell a story where two people fall in love and one of them has to overcome obstacles in order to get to the other one. And Mm -hmm. the way that the Greeks tell it is not the only possible version. Uh, So then you start to be able to ask, why do the Greeks tell this story this way and not the way other people tell it? Yeah, and so that's what's so interesting to me, too, is that there are other versions of what is such a similar story and features this fascinating aspect of swimming. I was so surprised to see that part where you had shared all of these other very similar stories from around the world mythology generally. That's so interesting and it was unexpected, I have to say. <laughs> well, that's that's kind of what attracted me to your blog in the first place was I was like, you know... I think it's really important to see that Greek mythology kind of fits in with mythology all over the world. And there's all these different versions of the same story, like you say. Mm -hmm. Um, So one example, and this is a story from uh, New Zealand. It's a Maori story. And we have it recorded from the 19th century. So we don't know how old this story is, but it might be very old. In any case, it's so close to being the same story as Hero and Leander, and yet totally different, all right? This is a story of Hinamoa and Tutanak. I don't have to say it out loud very often. <laughs> T- Hin- Hinamoa and Tutanaki. And they fall in love at a party, uh, but they can't get married. So, so far, very much like Hero and Leander. Uh, they can't even talk to each other because Hinamoa's father watches her and she won't let her go out. She won't, he, he won't let Tutanake come over and hang out with her. Uh, she's, you know, all isolated. Tutanake every night uh, plays his flute sadly from his island where he lives in the middle of the lake. And she can hear it, but she can't get to him. So one night 
uh, she decides to paddle a canoe over to him, but then she can't find a canoe. All the canoes are, I don't know, chained up or something. And so she decides to swim. She gets uh, some help from um, swimming floats from empty gourds that she finds on the shore. She sort of wraps herself in the fishing nets and the empty gourds so that that'll help her swim. And she swims and it's very far uh, just like Leander crossing the Hellespont, and she she gets very tired, and she's not sure if she's going to make it, but finally she does make it, uh, and she's lying there on the on the shore, half dead, and Tutanake finds her there on the shore, and picks her up, and takes her home, puts her in a hot bath, and uh, gives her some soup, and she starts feeling better, and then they get married and live happily ever after. So, you know, that's the same story, right? These two people fell in love and they were separated by water and by, you know, society that didn't want them to get together. But in this version, first of all, it's the girl that swims and not the guy. And second, she lives. She's fine. They live happily ever after. Nobody dies. So, you know, that's that really struck me as like, wow, you know, there's a whole different way to tell this story where it's, it's still an interesting story, but it's not a tragedy. Yeah, it's much nicer. I mean, not that Hero <laughs> Manor is not nice, but it's nice to have uh, like something that just ends well, like, oh, what the, isn't that a nice little, little story about perseverance that actually works out in the end? <laughs> right. And he's so nice to her. He gets her a bath and everything. It's kind yeah. of just very, you know, it's kind of less aggressive than the Greek story, right? How does she fall in love with him? Because he plays his flute to her every night. That's so sweet. <laughs> <laughs> like That would make a really nice story. Why don't the Greeks tell it that way? So it just, it enables us to kind of see how to think about Greek myths. That's my point in general, that mm -hmm. we, we have to think about, we can't just see the Greek myths. We have to ask ourselves, for each myth, how do other people tell this story so that we can see that the Greeks have a particular way of looking at the world and they're not just, it's, that's not the only possible way this story could be told, right? Mm -hmm. I have another version of it from ancient Egypt. And this time we know that this version comes long before the Greek version. Oh, right. right. This, is a, this is a story from a thousand years before the Greek version and uh, from the Bronze Age. And in this version, uh, the guy is a young man and uh, his girlfriend is on the other side of the river. He calls her his sister, but that's like a Egyptian euphemism for girlfriend, mm. right? Interesting. He says, my sister's across the river, but we know he really means his girlfriend. Uh, and uh, he says, the river is between our bodies. She's on the far side. The river is in flood. There are crocodiles in it. So again, we're setting it up. So it's a dangerous thing that he's going to do. But he says, I enter the water and brave the waves. My heart is strong. The crocodile seems like a mouse to me. Uh, and the flood is like land under my feet. Like, I feel like I'm invincible because I'm going to my girlfriend. I'm so brave. And again, you know, as we don't hear the end of the story, it just ends there. But, you know, we can see that he's going to get there. He's going to reach his girlfriend. They're going to live happily ever after. So, you know, the crocodile is like a mouse to him because he's so much in love. That's kind of yeah. a nice image. Also. It's lovely. I love that it's also first person. Like there's something really affecting about that too. Where yeah. it's like, no, I'm doing this. I feel this way. Like, and you know, especially first person coming from the perspective of the man is lovely too, because mm -hmm. it's a little bit more like he's the one in love, which of course is a bit of, you know, not particularly common trope when it comes to Greek myth or of that no, nature. That's true. that's true. He's really romantically in love with, with the girl. He's yeah, not, it's nice. He's not trying to, and he's not trying to rape her or anything as yeah. so often in Greek myth. <laughs> Lord, yeah. Right? He's yeah. not tricking her. She wants him. He wants her. It's like this very nice mutual story. I mean, and that you also see in Hero and Leander, 
Mm. Right. It's kind of unusual among Greek myths in that it's mutual. They're both in love. Yeah, which is very refreshing. As right? I mean, that's like the whole crux of my podcast. A lot is talking about the treatment of women or the way they're, you know, written into these stories or rather told in the stories. I mean, and the only is, other one refreshing. I can think of is Pyramus and Thisbe. Yeah, which is another that we get primarily from Ovid, right? Where it's like right, he yeah. he also sometimes writes the a little bit less. Well, I mean, it, of course, it depends because sometimes he is writing more problematic things. But there are some good cases of his writing where, yeah, Pyramus and Thisbe is so lovely. Another very Shakespearean story. And exactly. Then this one, it's, it's yeah, another nice. one that appealed yeah. to Shakespeare, for sure. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, it's not impossible in Greek myth to have both <laughs> parties, you know, just romantically loving each other. But it's not super common. And, mm -hmm. you know, so it's, I think it's something that kind of attracted me about the Leander story, but then you see that it can be told again in all these different ways. Mm -hmm. There's a very similar version that's told as an Ethiopian folk story that, um, I again, you know, we only know it from the early 20th century when somebody went to Ethiopia, some anthropologist and was like, tell me all your old stories. So we don't know how far back this story goes, but it's so much like the Egyptian story from the Bronze Age that, I don't know, I just found, I was like, wow, this story is like the same as the Egyptian story, almost. But it also has aspects of being like the Maori story. Mm -hmm. So in the, in the Ethiopian story, the girl is actually already nearby. But he, his, her family won't let him marry her until he shows that he's brave. And he has to show that he's brave by swimming to an island in the middle of the lake and staying there overnight by himself and then swimming back in the morning. Huh. So it's not a question of getting to her in this version. Yeah. He's just going out to the island and staying the night by himself to show how brave he is. And then they'll let him marry her. And he does. He just, you know, he's brave and he wants to marry her. So he swims out to the island and he stays the night there and then he comes back. That's the story. It's not yeah. a super suspenseful story when you tell it that way. <laughs> it's kind of lacking a little something in drama, but but it's a story that shows, you know, courage, but not like it's impossible to swim out to the island and then back. It's something that they kind of, they're not trying to kill him, right? It doesn't have a lot of drama in this version because mm -hmm. they're, he just does it. But we can also say that, um, that you can see that these are cultures where swimming out to the island, crossing the river to get to your girlfriend, these aren't impossible things. They're, you know, the, the girl's family in the Ethiopian story, they don't, they're not trying to kill him. They don't want him to die. They want him to show that he's, that he really wants to marry her. Yeah. You know, it's like buying an engagement ring. It's, you know, it's not, uh, you know, getting a job. They're not asking him to do something impossible. Uh, where in the Leander story, you kind of get the feeling that this is something that like ordinary people shouldn't attempt. Well, and right? the difference is like, he's doing it all the time too. And so it's like, Presumably oh, that means, yeah, that he's done it a few times successfully. And it's just that almost he keeps going too much or is perhaps too persistent in, you know, pushing against what they are and are not supposed to be doing in their relationship. It's interesting. You know, that's a really good point that I hadn't really thought about that much that, you know, if he had just done it once, it comes out great. Yeah, it's the same story. <laughs> and then rescued her. And then they could have maybe gotten married or something. That would have been the same story, right? So why is he doing it over and over again? It's like hubris, right? It's like mm -hmm. pushing bait to keep yeah. doing it. And especially with a storm and everything, like take a night off, you know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, like maybe, maybe not just this once, you know? <laughs> it's interesting because it, even the way you were talking about the other versions too, you know, where it does end up good in the end and they have a happy ending it's interesting to me because these are nice stories where it you know it's a very like 
traditional like sounds like a you know mythological esque tale, but it is also very human. It's very much mm-hmm. something that yeah, and maybe Leander's is a little bit different, but otherwise it's something that like a human can achieve to prove themselves themselves right. versus like I'm so used to like they're not killing Grendel or yeah they're you know, not you know they're not doing a Herculean task they're they're right. you know proving themselves but in a very human kind of way and it's it's quite lovely and very I mean different certainly for how what I look at every day which is I'm just starting another episode on on Heracles so I'm thinking of you know his tasks his right. feats versus yeah this very human tale of like no this is a thing I can do to like really prove myself to this person that I love but also it's not yeah it's not impossible it's not going to definitely kill me I'm probably going to be okay and I'll have proven myself but on the other hand okay so now I've given you the stories that come from people who do swim who are comfortable Mm. swimming and who see it as a you know like you said sort of a normal brave thing to do but then if you start looking at some other cultures where people are less enthusiastic about swimming uh you can see that there are there are whole different more afraid of the water ways to tell this story also where the greek story is kind of in the middle Mm -hmm. right so on the one hand we've already seen stories where people are good at swimming and they expect to survive this experience and get married but we also have this story from ancient india from this maybe the 300s BC, so around the mm. same time as a lot of Greek myths, um, earlier than our earliest version of the Leander story, but not so early that people might not have already been telling the Leander story. Mm-hmm. Uh, and in this version, it's a story, it's like one of Aesop's fables. It's a, a Jataka tale, which are like Aesop's fables. They're animal stories. Oh, okay. So in this version, uh, there's a goat. And in fact, a lot of these Indian stories are the same as Aesop's fables. And we don't know whether the Indian storyteller got it from the Greeks or whether the Greeks got it from the Indian stories. Oh, that's so interesting. That's And it could be both. I mean, yeah. they, they're just stories that are going around at this time. Yeah. Uh, so the, the Jataka tale is about a goat uh, whose mother-in-law is not satisfied that he is a good enough husband for her daughter uh and she wants him to swim out to an island stop me if you've heard this before (laughs) right in the river and get her the green grass that grows there to show that he's brave enough to marry the daughter uh and the goat says no he says i'm not gonna swim out to the island it's dangerous uh he says he doesn't want to die and he, so he's not going to swim out to the island. And he tells his mother-in-law there are plenty of other girl goats in the world. <laughs> and he just moves on. That's the end of the story. <laughs> wow. So. <laughs> right? So that's a really different. Hmm. Yeah, she tells yeah. him to go out and prove himself. And he's like, no, man, that sounds dangerous. I'll marry somebody else. <laughs> that's that's so interesting because it is so similar and then just a complete left turn of like no it's not worth this no it's not you know i don't think i want her that bad (laughs) so it just shows that again that you can tell this story in different ways leander doesn't have to swim across the hellespont to hero he could be like no there are girls over here on this side yeah that's it's so interesting. I'd never thought this much about swimming in ancient myth in general. I mean, it's funny because I've been following you on Twitter for a long time. So I feel like I've seen mentions of your book on swimming in the right. ancient world in the past. And I've sort of just been like vaguely curious about what exactly that would entail. So now hearing all of this, it's really interesting to just even consider stories of swimming, I guess. I think I'm just so used to, yeah. you know, general well, we're going to sail on a ship. I'm not talking about, you know, somebody actually swimming somewhere. Well, but like in Ovid, you actually, there are a lot of references to swimming in oh. Ovid, but most of them are, it's all like the, the nymph is in the water taking her bath and then someone comes along and rapes her. Right. Yes. Right. There's a lot of that. Right. Nymph when, swimming. When they're just in there. Yeah. 
Uh, so swimming in Ovid tends to be more a question of, ooh, look, she has her clothes off, and, you know, now it's like she's asking for it. Right, yes. Right, so this is, the Leander and Hero story is kind of an exception to a more general rule of, well, what did you expect would happen if you went in swimming, obviously. Yeah. That's gonna end badly. That's interesting, too, because it also has that inherent nature of, like, well, the nymphs are women swimming versus Leander swimming as a man for a woman. Mm -hmm. Like, it's also, it's very different style like a very different setting as well that sort of then inherently is like oh well you know men can swim but if a woman goes ahead and swims she's really you know she's asking for herself to be put she's into some horrible trouble yeah yeah clearly. yeah and yet in the maori story she just swims over to him yeah which no is awesome deal. <laughs> <laughs> I love that she also in that one is it's like I couldn't find a canoe, so I'm gonna do all of this really unique and creative things to make it easier on myself because I'm still gonna get there. Like canoe or no canoe, like I'm gonna do it. I love that. Yeah, it's sort of a weak point in the story where she can't get a canoe and they're like, <laughs> and she just can't. Like all the canoes are, I don't know, busy. <laughs> but it gives her a good reason to like make her swimming much more impressive. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Would have been less exciting if she just found a little a little canoe to go over in. Not as not as thrilling no, of a tale. True. So here's another one, though, where the girl yeah. swims. Okay. But again, from India, which we've already seen is a place where swimming is dangerous and people don't want to do it, right? This one is a little more sort of morally complex uh, because the girl is uh, not only does she, she falls in love with the guy, there, but her, not only will her family not let her marry him, but they make her marry somebody else that she doesn't love. And so she's very unhappy. And she continues to see the, her lover, even though she's married to somebody else. Uh, so we know already that this is bound to end badly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? I mean, just in the, in the nature of myth, this is not a story that's going to end happily. And it doesn't. Yeah. Uh, women in so <laughs> every night she swims across the river to her boyfriend, who's on the other side of the river, away when her husband's sleeping. But because this is India, she doesn't know how to swim. Or she doesn't really know how to swim. So she takes along an old pot that she keeps hidden in the bushes by the water. And she holds it upside down so it holds air. And that's like the float that she uses to get across the, yeah. the water. Like... The Maori girl used the Hinamoa used the the fishing floats. Oh yeah, right. Yeah. So she she's using an empty pot, and this goes on for a while. She she swims across to him, but her sister in law figures out what's going on. Her her husband's sister, and he she doesn't like it that her her husband's wife is cheating on him, uh, and so. She, rather than say anything, she sneakily replaces the pot with one that hasn't been fired yet, that's just dry clay. And uh, Sony doesn't notice that the pot is just a dried clay pot and not one that's been fired hard. So she starts swimming across with this pot and it turns to mud as she's swimming and disintegrates and she drowns. And as in the hero and Leander story, then her boyfriend uh, jumps in after her, but he drowns too. Oh, wow. And so it's like hero and Leander in that both of them drown. It's a little more dramatic than hero and Leander in that we have a, a sort of moral reason why they have to drown, right? Because they're adulterers. Mm -hmm. Well, and there's sabotage generally. In a way and they're sabotaged. Like, yeah. yeah. I, re 
the world is really mean to them in a way that we haven't really seen yet, right? We've seen people saying, we want you to be brave or courageous or with hero, you know, she's a priestess, so she can't marry. But this is the first one. And I think maybe the only version where people are actively terrible to them. Yeah. And it's a woman too. That feels very, <laughs> very like an ancient myth. Oh yeah. Very sneaky. Yeah. 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 Like it's not her husband that does this. Oh no. It's got to be the woman involved. Interesting. Uh, and that's, that's a story that it doesn't go back to antiquity. It becomes famous in a, a, version that was told in the 1700s that mm. became kind of a very very popular story in the 1700s and so we don't I'm not really sure how far back it goes before that but and you know so it might be a story that's actually based on the story of hero and leander right but it has a kind of indian twist to it uh where it's even worse in the story of even of hero and leander she actually has to marry this other guy that she doesn't like and then her sister-in-law betrays her yeah I mean, and and not only that but she also doesn't know how to swim i mean she really even though she's going across she actually she can't swim well enough to save herself when the pot falls apart yeah. It almost makes her even more brave while she's doing it, you know, when she is successful in it. Like, if you don't know how to swim to that degree and you're still going over every night to be with the man you love because you've been forced to marry somebody you don't love, like, you know, there's an extra level of emotional, like, heft in that story right? for them to, yeah, and then it still manages to end tragically and even more tragically because there is sabotage, because there's somebody like actively working against them. It's not just, you know, the random luck of a storm that Leander probably just shouldn't have swum through in the first place. Right. Like, but, yeah, right. A minute ago we were saying like, well, you know, it's kind of hubris, right? He could take a night off mm -hmm. or whatever. But, but in this version, there's no element of that. Yeah. Right? We're it's, not blaming her for it. She couldn't, we've eliminated the part where she could have just done it once and then they could get married. They yep. can't do that because she's already married. We've eliminated the storm, so there's no reason why she would have not gone over that particular night. It's yeah. just all other people's fault and tragedy. Yeah, just generic, just general you can tragedy. see why it became so popular, this version, because it's, it's actually in some ways a better story Yeah, than Hero and Leander. And it has so much in it, too, where it's, I'm sure that, you know, its level of popularity also spanned people coming at it from different places, right? Like people who were siding with her and finding her to be this like tragic, you know, romantic character or people who, you know, maybe were siding with her husband and it's like, well, you know, right. It, it, yeah. Like, well, that's what you, you get. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Like you wronged me. So that's the trouble or, you know, yeah, it's, it's interesting. I'm sure it, you could come at it from so many different, so many different sides and then yeah that's it, it's so fascinating to me how there are so many different versions of what ultimately is a really similar story that's so interesting right. i mean it seems like this is a pretty simple story they're in love but they're separated he has to swim across the river like what more could there be but then you see there's all these different possible ways to yeah. tell the story you start to see the choices that the greeks are making right? Where they could have told the story all these other ways. How come they decide to tell it this way? Yeah. And I think that's, that's where we should be every time we hear a Greek myth, we mm -hmm. should ask ourselves, what are some other ways that you could tell this story? And why are they telling it this way? Yeah. Right. Like, I, okay, I have two more versions. Okay. And they're in both cases, we've managed to get a happy ending out of the story in a non-swimming culture by having them not swim. <laughs> so we, instead of having, having to choose, having swimming be at the center of the story and then having to choose whether they're going to live or die, we've had the happy ending at the center of the story and we've accomplished that by taking the swimming out. So that's yeah. a whole different approach to the, the question, right? There's a, a medieval version from Boccaccio 
uh, from medieval Italy in the 1300s, where uh, Gianni wants to see his girlfriend Restituta, who's on the other side of the water, like we've been seeing. Uh, but he takes a boat. Well, <laughs> he just gets in the rowboat and rows over to her. He swims sometimes when the boat isn't available, but mostly he just rows over in the boat. And then they do have a bunch of other adventures that I don't remember. But in the end, they get married and live happily ever after. That's very nice. So, that seems like a great solution. <laughs> a great solution. You can see Boccaccio being like, well, the story of Hero and Leander, but like, what if he had a boat? Yeah, it's like the Maori one. Like, what if she did find a canoe? Would have been simpler. <laughs> so Boccaccio just gives him a boat. And that solves the problem. And yeah. you have to say with Hero and Leander, too. Like, all right, he's doing it over and over again, as we've said. Why doesn't he get a boat? Well, I also would think, like, if you're living on the Hellespont, you're like, there's boats around. Like, Right. I mean, this... it's not like there's no boats. No. Like, this is an important region i mean i don't know a ton about the history but i know mythologically it's right. important so i imagine it was also important you know in the I'm real sure world it's where the trojan war is yeah and it's you know they've got a whole mythological story that explains it and its name mm -hmm. and everything and and it yeah it, it's fascinating the idea that it's just i mean you could find a boat i'm sure he could have found a boat right he's not in the <laughs> middle of nowhere no there's exactly. a tower there are priestesses. Yeah. yeah. You could get a boat. Yeah. So why doesn't... Then when you hear about Boccaccio giving his character a boat, you think, well, why doesn't Leander get a boat? It's a stupid story. Just ups the tragedy factor. <laughs> and then one final story. This is from the Shanama, which is the big collection of stories from medieval Islam, from mm. Iran. Uh, it's by Ferdowsi, and it's, again, ext an extremely popular collection of stories running over a bunch of generations, like, I don't know, Game of Thrones or something, <laughs> where, uh, you know, Dune, where, you know, you have this group of people, and then they have children, and their children have adventures, and then they have children, and their children have adventures. So this is near the beginning. Um, and... Uh, it's the story of Rudaba and Zal. And uh, Zal comes to town. And because this is medieval Islam, he doesn't see Rudaba. She's locked up in the house. But he hears someone else describing how beautiful Rudaba is. And he falls in love with her from the description without ever having laid eyes on her or spoken to her. Uh, and... Uh, he's so much in love with her just from the description that he goes to the tower that she's locked in by her father. Uh, and uh, he gets her to let down her long hair so that he can climb up it to the tower. And, you know, then he gets to know her better and eventually they uh, elope. Wow. And they get married and live happily ever after. So Rapunzel and, is based in Islam. <laughs> or is it an Islamic oh, yeah. story? So yeah, you've heard this story about Rudaba, <laughs> Rudaba let down your hair. Sure <laughs> right. So uh, yeah, I mean, Rapunzel turns out to be basically the story of Hero and Leander if you take the swimming out so that it can have a happy ending. Yeah, that's so interesting. Just generally, that that a story that's become so popular in Western, like you know, lore, I guess, could have its origins though in a in a story from medieval Islamic Iran. That's so interesting. But it kind of makes more sense that way because in like medieval Europe, why is she locked up in the tower? Yeah. But in medieval Islam, it makes total sense that she's locked up in the tower. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, in, in the Western canon, they have to, like, make, you know, well, she's got an evil witch stepmother or whatever it is in that story. Right. It's like, you know, there's got to be some woman doing it versus right. just, like, tradition. Right. That's but here she's just locked up in the tower because that's how women lived. But she has to let down her hair so that he can climb up and see her so they can fall yeah. in love so they can get married. That's so interesting. That's great. 
Rudaba, I mean, then you can see the roots of this story in the old water swimming stories because Rudaba actually means river water girl. Oh, so she's originally the river water girl, but in the story, it has nothing to do with water at all. Yeah, unless you count like her rippling long hair coming down or something like that. But yeah. I wonder if it has origins then in a story that's lost that does have water I think, in it. I think it must. I mean, I think who, the whoever made up this version knew a version where there was swimming. But yeah. they wanted a happy ending and they didn't see a happy ending for people who were swimming. And they just took the swimming out of it. Yeah. That's really interesting and actually just connects to what I was thinking of earlier anyway. Um, cause I'm, I'm the thing that makes me curious and endlessly frustrated all the time is considering what versions of myths might have existed that we don't have, you know, or, you know, even, even more interesting is what stories might've existed in like in women's circles that like really never mm -hmm. got written down, you know, let alone lost ever, but more so just these stories that might've existed that were just truly a hundred percent oral storytelling, you know, among women when they were together and what kind of versions they might have told and what, you know, I think, especially with a story like Kiro and Leander, where, you know, our surviving text version is from Ovid, if not Ovid's time period generally. Um, but then, you, like you said, we know that it's older and then so, you know, what what text sources of it might have existed that we don't have and, you know, where mm -hmm. might they have differed? But that's the story. Yeah. Is there a, a women's version of this story where Hero swims over to Leander? Yeah. Or where, like, he swims over to her and she's like, look, dude, I'm happy being a, a priestess of Aphrodite. Like, I don't need you. Go amongst yourself. Right? Like, go on your merry <laughs> way. Like, because that's one thing that interests me in that whole, the whole idea of it is that we're just supposed to assume I think, well, and again, like I haven't, I haven't read the source just yet. Um, but like it, it, you know, did she actually love him? Do we know if she loved him or do we just know that he wanted her and she was a priestess of Aphrodite? And so he kept going back to her. Like, do we have her voice saying like, oh, I'm mad that I can't marry you kind of thing. I mean, I think it's clear from the story that she loves him too. Like, mm. because she actually has options, right? She's locked in the tower, but she's not alone. She could tell people that he was coming. Right. So she could just be like, no, no. Like, if 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 she wanted to just remain that. And maybe it's that she wanted to remain a priestess of Aphrodite and she wanted to have him too. Like, I respect that. You know, not wanting to give up right, her, sure. her priestess <laughs> status, but also being like, no, well, I like you. So let's just make this work. Let's make both work. <laughs> But it's also true that the Greeks have a really hard time even imagining the question of consent for women. So just the fact that she's there. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's not a big part of the story. She's yeah. She's there. And thus, she's consent. Her consent yeah. is just kind of assumed. Yeah. I've read enough Hesiod. <laughs> right. <laughs> I don't think it's a Greek question whether she consents. No, certainly not. Sometimes it is in Ovid, though, which is what interests me, is that like he often, in Metamorphoses specifically, often makes it clear when it is non-consensual in a way that I've found you know, a few other sources that I read tend to. But that that's so interesting. So when it comes to um, your book, which is swimming, do you focus mostly on these stories of swimming or do you, are you touching on swimming more broadly than these stories as well? I'm just fascinated by the idea of a book. Oh, about no, swimming. I mean, the book really tries to cover everything. Yeah. <laughs> but the, the main point of the book, I wouldn't actually say it covers everything. It's not like I've tried to collect every single possible mention of swimming from the ancient world. That's not really what I did. Uh, what I really was trying to show was I was trying to ask the question, why is Leander's story kind of in the middle, mm. right? It's not like the Indian stories where people don't even want to get in the water. They don't even know how to swim. Leander knows how to swim. Yeah. Right. And he's willing to get in the water. And it's not like the Egyptian or Maori stories where they just swim and that's fine. And then they get married. Uh, so it's somewhere in the middle. And the explanation I found was that the Greeks belong to a kind of Northern Asian culture, Northern European and Asian culture that seems to have forgotten how to swim in the last ice age hmm. when it was cold. 
they were up north. So it makes sense that they forgot how to swim. And when the ice age is over, they venture south again and like they meet people, they meet the Egyptians and other people in South China and stuff. And they're like, wow, these people can swim. That's so weird because they don't know how to swim. Huh. And rather, you might think they would just be like, can you show me how to do that? But that's not what happens. What happens is that they say, well, there's probably a good reason why we don't swim. Like maybe it's because we're decent human beings that don't take off our clothes and <laughs> show everyone our bodies. Maybe that's why. Or maybe it's because, and you see that in Ovid, where when girls take their clothes off, they get raped. Yeah. Right? Um, or maybe it's because the gods actually don't like it when people get in the water like that. Like they like the water to be smooth and calm and not all splashy with people getting in it. Like Hesiod has a whole thing about not peeing in the water. <laughs> does he really? And he does. He's like, gods really hate that. You shouldn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. Like not not when you're in the water. Like you shouldn't stand on the edge of the water and pee into it. Right. Just not at all. Right. Yeah. Just not at all. Gods don't like it. And you can see that that's also kind of one of the reasons that they kind of make up for not wanting to, why they don't swim and the Egyptians yeah. do. And then they also, they're, they're like, also swimming's very dangerous. You could get a cramp. You could, you could, you know, you could get lost in the water and not be able to find the other side. Who knows? Like, you know, it's very dangerous. That's why we don't swim probably because it's really dangerous. Right? So they make up all these reasons. <laughs> I love that. But meanwhile, the Egyptian story is like, not only do we swim, but we swim in crocodile infested waters. <laughs> like, right? Because we don't even care. Yeah, exactly. Like, <laughs> you know, the Greeks are like, oh, it's dangerous. We don't really have a ton of scary things in the water, but the water itself, it's dangerous. <laughs> it is dangerous. So we stay out of it. Yeah. <laughs> but then over time, because we know Leander does know how to swim in the story, over time, I think they learn from the Egyptians how to swim. Yeah. And then the attitude that they end up with is not everybody learns how to swim, but only very sophisticated, cool people. Like kind of the upper class know how to swim. So that, and you see it in Greek stories and in Roman stories, Julius Caesar is supposed to have been a really great swimmer. Because he's a hero. Odysseus is a great swimmer. Right. right. But what happens when Odysseus is shipwrecked? All the, all the sailors drown. Yeah, but not him. Right? None of them know how to swim. Only Odysseus can swim. And it's it's kind of that way throughout antiquity that some people can swim, but only like the best people, the Aristoi, can swim. Huh. Everybody else just drowns when they get in the water. And uh so that's kind of the midpoint that the that the Greeks end up at as on the one hand they're still kind of afraid of the water on the other hand brave aristocratic type people are supposed to learn how to swim anyway cuz they're so brave and that is kind of the attitude that has come down to us where we're like we also feel that it's, you know, we're very concerned about danger and about people peeing in the water and about <laughs> how much of your body is covered in your bathing suit and how you look in your bathing suit. And these are all concerns that we still really have with us. Um, but at the same time, we feel that we should learn how to swim because it's important for people of a certain social class to be able to swim, right? Yeah. So, it's, you know... It's really something that we associate with like expensive vacations, with country clubs, with um, Ivy League colleges that have swimming requirements, right? It's, it's still something that kind of belongs to rich people, yeah. educated people. And it is a status, right? Like it's a status, you know, thing. it's a thing. Yeah. Like even, you know, wealth aside too, it is a thing if you don't know how to swim, you know, and whether or not 
it should be, right. but yeah. I but mean, it is. Yeah. And and all of that, I think, we get from the Greeks. And, you know, it's not like, oh, who even cares? Well, it was a long time ago. It's something that's really still affecting us today. It's the reason so many poor children drown. Yeah. Because we don't really think poor children should know how to swim. We think it's really something only for rich people. And it's the reason why we don't open more public pools in cities because we don't really think those people should be swimming we think yeah rich people with pools in their backyards that's good for them to swim that's wild yeah there's actually there's a really good story though a kind of, uh, that is told by a it's in the book in my book uh that's a and someone who's an immigrant in canada that's originally from india and so he doesn't know how to swim because he's from India, which, as we've seen, is a place where swimming has not been historically a very big deal. And uh, he goes to the pool because he wants to kind of learn how to swim. And he says he's trying to arrange for lessons. And the woman says, oh, don't feel bad. Like, we get a lot of Indian immigrants here, the Canadian woman behind the desk. Uh, and, and, you know, it's common that Indian immigrants don't know how to swim. And he's like... He gets all huffy. He's like, no, most Indians are really good swimmers. It's just me that doesn't know how to swim. <laughs> and, and, you know, he doesn't want it to be stereotyped as someone who doesn't know how to swim. Yeah. But the Canadian woman is clearly aware that immigrants are much less likely to know how to swim than Canadians are. Yeah. Than, than born Canadians. Yeah. Or, uh, so... I mean, clearly there is some issue that that the Indian author is getting at in yeah. the story. Learning to swim was pretty normal in terms of like our community centers offer it. But now I'm curious about whether that's like a generalized assumption on my part or what have you. I've just never, never really thought about it. Or another question is how well do people learn to swim? Like I yeah, grew up that... partly in France and we had swimming lessons from school every week free, right? Mm. Everybody had to learn to swim. But I would say most of the people, this is like fifth grade, so we weren't going to have a lot more lessons after this point, right? And most of the people could swim in the sense that they could like take their feet off the bottom. But I don't know if a lot of them could swim several laps. Yeah. Like they could probably swim a lap maybe. But, they, you know, they were kind of splashing. <laughs> yeah. They weren't really I mean, great swimmers. <laughs> no, and I think that's that's probably true here for sure. Like, I don't consider myself a great swimmer. But, like, you know, I wouldn't die right away is kind of how I right. see my swimming prowess, right. which is that, like. So that's that's what's true in Europe also, yeah. that they, they kind of make sure that everybody can swim in the sense that, like, if they fall into a pond, that maybe they'll be able to stay afloat until someone can get them. Yeah, but they're not swimmers in the sense that uh, Leander is, or yeah. that um, Julius Caesar <laughs> is, right? Where they swim, kind of, or or that that Hinamoa in the Maori story is, where mm -hmm. he can swim a mile, really, basically just for fun. I mean, it's she's not shipwrecked or anything. Yeah, yeah. There's definitely a difference there for sure. Or somebody who just like is like good at it, or. Yeah, or even just technique. I don't think I know much in the way of right. swimming. I mean, technique. I'm a, I'm a fairly good swimmer, but I I'm not sure that I can swim a mile. Yeah, I wouldn't want to try. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, just a lot of these things are kind of still with us from this really ancient thing that happened at the end of the last ice age. And we yeah. still have a lot of those same concerns and the same abilities and, and inabilities that we inherit from that. I'll, I'll leave you with one funny story that happened while I was researching the book. And I'm reading uh, an Islamic doctor, uh, I think it's Ibn Sina, is talking about uh why you shouldn't swim, why, under what circumstances you should swim. And he says, you shouldn't swim right after eating 
which you may have heard somebody yeah. tell you, you shouldn't swim right after eating, right? But the reason he gives why you shouldn't swim right after eating is it'll make you fat. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to hear so, the logic. <laughs> right? Well, no, he has a logic. He says yeah. it's, it'll, it'll slow down your digestion so the food will be in your stomach longer and you'll like absorb more of it. Interesting. And, but, so I was told this story is you would get cramp. Yeah. But apparently that's just like, people got tired of saying, like, it was embarrassing to say you would get fat. <laughs> so <laughs> so they, they kind of adjusted the story to be less embarrassing. Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> but but the, the original version seems to be Ibn Sina saying, like, don't go in the water right after eating because it'll make you fat. Weight. That's wild. That's that's wild. That's really that's bizarre. <laughs> uh, well, oh my gosh, this has been really. I'm so fascinated to know all of this swimming stuff that I just had no idea of how much it touched upon so many different world mythologies. And I've been really trying to get more like I my background is totally in Greek, and that's where like all of my knowledge when it comes to research and everything lies. So I'm thrilled to have other people on who can talk about other mythologies and stuff, and especially how they connect with these stories. It's so interesting. So thank you so much. Oh, thank you for having me. This is a lot of fun. I'm, I'm always glad. happy to have a chance to talk about it. <laughs> yeah, I bet. That's that, that's why I love talking to academics, because you guys have your topics, and then just, it's so interesting, and it's always results in such a fun and fascinating conversation. I appreciate it. Is uh, there um, anything you want to share with my listeners in terms of uh, your book, when it comes out, where they could get it, or anything else? It's uh, available on Amazon. It should be for sale in bookstores also. It should be out July 4th. Wonderful. And uh, yeah, I hope you will get it because there are many, many, many more swimming stories in it that I haven't that's, told yet. That's so fascinating. I love it. Well, thank you so much. It's really, I love, yeah, love learning all of this. It's great. <laughs> thank you for having me. Thank you. Ugh, oh, nerds. Thank you all for listening. As always, conversation episodes are so wonderful because they really allow me to branch just so far beyond my standard mythological fare, but also, like, not at the same time, you know? Like, the way I did not expect this episode that was ostensibly about Hero and Leander to turn into such a fascinating look at swimming across the ancient world, let alone the way these stories interact with one another and say things about the world in which they were developed. It's fascinating. Swimming. Who'd have thought? Plus, bonus, this conversation, which I'll admit we had back in, I think, February, but it prompted me to finally cover the story of Hero and Leander on the podcast. Man, the background and history on that one is, is fascinating in itself. You can find out more about Professor Carr's work by following her on Twitter. I've linked it in the episode's description. And find the new book, Shifting Currents, A World History of Swimming. It's available now. Let's Talk About Myths Baby is written and produced by me, Liv Albert. Michaela Smith is the Hermes to my Olympians and handles so many podcast-related things, from running the YouTube to creating promotional images and videos to editing and research and more. Stephanie Foley works to transcribe the podcast for YouTube captions and accessibility. The podcast is hosted and monetized by Acast. I am Liv, and I love this shit just so very much. <laughs>